Welcome to this edition of Rallying the Bars. I'm your host, Ransom Moose. August 21st marks the 52nd anniversary of the assassination of Comrade George L. Jackson. This episode of Rallying the Bars is being taped August 21st, 2023. When I came into the Real News office, the marquee read, Free all political prisoners. And nothing is more appropriate than our show today. Ed Poindexter and the late Mondo Way Longa are two political prisoners, the Omaha Two, who were framed, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison in 1971 for the murder of Omaha police officer Larry Menard, who died when a suitcase dynamite bomb exploded in a vacant house in North Omaha on August 17, 1970. Here to talk about the case of the Omaha Two are Tekla Ali Johnson, supporter of political prisoners, Adrian Payne, a Poindexter's sister, and Erica Ricky Payne, a Poindexter's niece. Welcome to Rallying the Bars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all right, you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, Miss Adrian. All right, let's let's start with you. You you're a Poindexter's sister. Uh, yes. And so tell us a little bit about. A, your brother, for the benefit of our audience. Oh, uh, he, he is a kind, wonderful brother. He is, uh, he is like my best friend. Um, he always stood beside me, and he was just wonderful. You know, you, you couldn't say anything bad about him. And as we were growing up, like I said, he was always there. And we did things together. He would take me places with him. He never was like, oh, little sister, get back and all that. (laughs) He was never like that. (laughs) Yeah. And if you can recall, can you recall, if you can, the day that they arrested him, and if you can remember, what was that like? Oh, it was terrible. It was they were standing behind the bushes and and the house. They had the house around it. Mm-hmm. And um, I came out on the porch and I, I was in Ricky and I said, don't shoot my brother. He's mm-hmm. coming out. He's not going to resist. And he came on out and he came out without, you know, any, um, any recourse or anything. And they took him on into the car. It was so sad. And that was that was in the seventies, and he'd been in prison ever since. Yes. Yeah, he's uh, been in prison for fifty three years. I was six months old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And R- Ricky, you're right now. You're involved with the with the defense committee in terms of uh trying to uh get a release. And and by way of this conversation. Ed's co-defendant was uh has since then passed away, uh, Mundo We Langua has since then passed away. And what is the state of your uncle's health right at this juncture right now? Actually his health isn't very good. He has diabetes and they amputated his leg without telling anybody. And I know when me and my mom visited and they made they make visitations super hard. Um, you can only go on a Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. And when we did go to visit him, he was very confused. He was in a wheelchair, and I noticed that his legs were black. Mm. And so when I, so I guess I wasn't surprised that they amputated one, but it would have been nice if somebody would have let us know. And, you know, we're just really curious to how he got in that bad state. If you're controlling all his food and you're controlling everything, how how could he get to that point where his leg gets amputated? Yeah, and I, you know, I I uh, I did forty eight years, and I've been out all the three years. But I know this to be a fact: uh, when you're dealing with mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex, medical uh, is the medical situation in all prisons is inadequate. And I know when I got out. I got a physical, and I had when I got diagnosed, I had hepatitis C. I had got a knee replacement. While I was locked up. 
when I got out, I realized they realized that they put it in there wrong and I had to get it taken out again and done over. So I can so in terms of like your your observation and your concern, it's it's appropriate because you know, they're uh, misdiagnosing them or they're not properly diagnosed to save money. This is this is what goes on. But in terms of uh what's going on in terms of uh mobilizing to, to get his release, where are we stand at with that? What are some of the things going on around this case? Actually, um, we have done several things like um, Tecla has helped the Jericho uh, with a call to action where they call the prison and, you know, uh, demand certain things and demand his release. We did a walk with Preston Love Jr. Um, and Senator Ernie Chambers spoke at that particular Basically, we've been doing what we've been doing for over 50 years. Actually, it kind of went dormant for a little while mm -hmm. um, because we were told by my uncle because he was scared for us that he wanted us to just sit back and he was going to get out um, because my grandmother has been threatened. Uh, I guess we're a part of the Cointel Pro program. Um, I know that our... Uh, landline was tapped. Mm -hmm. my, grandma, my grandmother had to agree to it, but they said that as long as there was nothing said on the phone that had anything to do with my uncle, then they wouldn't do anything. And me and my sister, when we were little, we used to pick the phone up and be like, the dead person's in the basement. We wanted to see if the police were going to yeah, show yeah. up. <laughs> we yeah. were so bad. But yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just terrible. He tried to be a part of our family the whole time. Like, uh, we used to go see him once a week. Like, we watched the prison change. Like, how... Yeah, I know, uh, I know, yeah. Yeah, we used to go... My grandmother used to make him cookies. We got pictures that we used to go see him once a week. He used to send me to really fancy um, summer programs. He used to pay for those. Like, I did a dance class with this uh, really popular dancer named Sandra McSwain. Mm -hmm. Um, Jocelyn Art Museum, I was in the newspaper, uh, cause he sent me to that program one summer. So he tried to be like a hands-on uncle, even from prison. I thought that was absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, and, and we know from, we know from experience that, you know, family members that are, that's the whole thing to, to try to like, uh, destroy any type of family association. That's why you, when you said earlier about the visitation procedures is hard, uh, but overall, we you know like uh, I think Angela, uh, I think uh, Maya Angelou say I still rise regardless of the whatever goes on. You know, still I rise, and this is a case with your uncle Ed. You know, regardless of what's going on with it, still I rise, and I can understand him wanting to like take a position for y'all protection. At the same token, you know, where do in terms of the information about this case? Because I'm, I'm I'm reading where. The case has been from the from day one has been uh, oh, consistently inconsistent testimonies, fabricated evidence. Where where do, where do we stand in terms of trying to get some type of judicial release for a? You, you know what my biggest issue with that is okay okay this is me from the heart. My biggest issue is they send us to school to learn law and justice. They make us do this Pledge of Allegiance, and they promise us these rights and all these things. But with my uncle, none of that has been followed. They, uh, he basically been proven innocent because the person that they said made the 911 call wasn't the person who made the 911 call. They made us get a voice analysis person, and he said that wasn't Dwayne Peake on the 911 call. The, the judge got red as a beat and didn't say nothing, but they had promised my grandma that they would give him a new trial if they proved that that was not Dwayne Peake on the 911 call. Also, in that same trial, they said that he had explosive chemicals in his pocket. It's the same thing that's in laundry detergent. So we had a specialist say that that's something, whatever that chemical is, is also found in laundry detergent. Um, and then at that same trial, this police officer leaned over my grandma and said, you will not get out over my dead body. I don't care what these people say. 
I couldn't believe it. I told the I told the uh, reporter, "Did you hear that? Did you write that down? Did you record that?" And she, her name was Carol Schrader. She just ignored me. And we know that we know that from uh, from a, from our experience and observation that uh, J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO counterintelligence program, they created this primarily for the purpose of uh, completely destroying any type of political opposition, anybody that had an independent thinking process, anybody that was uh, uh, against the oppressive, abusive nature of the government, that they had a system where they had two ways they were going to approach them. Either they are going to kill them off or kill them by death by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts and you use the criminal justice system to lock them up. Which brings me to you, uh, um, Tegla. Now, you was involved, you've been involved with the case for longer than uh, most people. Talk, give us some background information on yourself and how you got involved with this case and, and where you at now in terms of like supporting aid. Well, my name is um, Tekla Ali Johnson. I currently teach African American studies um, and history, but most of my, you know, my work or my life has been in community um, organizing. And I think what led me to it was a relationship with the uh, Ed's co-defendant, Mondo Wilenga. And I want to, I would like to go through that and a few more things about the case. But before mm -hmm. I forget, I just wanted to pull out a couple of things. You asked about current things that um, have happened in terms of the family's involvement. And I just don't want to miss this, these two being said. Yeah. But in April, um, both uh, Ricky and um, Adrian made uh, a statement, which was a very important statement. They made it uh, uh, in a um, submission to the United Nations International Independent Expert Mechanism to advance racial justice. In other words, justices uh, from a committee from the United Nations came right. to five cities around the country. And and these two were able to speak to that. Afia Wangaza helped to organize the one in Atlanta, and they were able to make a presentation that was very I thought very, very powerful right. about the fence. So maybe you, maybe you got to see that, but I think that getting that to the United Nations has been so much effort to get it outside of the United States. First to get it out of Nebraska, knowledge about the case. Uh, Erica, I think you all would agree. And then to get the information on the national and then to get it to the United, United Nations. The other thing that they have been doing uh, recently is working very hard to secure an attorney specifically to look at the medical release. And they have acquired an attorney, and they'll be meeting with him at the end of this week, okay, uh, who yeah. has now agreed to do that. So the family has been very active in uh, this last year and in many in multiple years. But you just asked recently, where is it at right now? Right now, the, em the emphasis is on securing this medical release through okay. an additional attorney to come on board. As far as the uh, the case itself, uh, do you want me to go back through where yeah, that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want you because we need we need our audience to understand. The, 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 the exactly what's what's going on with them because when we say political prisoners oftentimes we look at it from a perspective of you know uh they politicize the individual but this was this is by design to like i said the quarantine pro had two objectives to stop the rise of a black what they call a black messiah or anybody that could lead people the, and the way they was going to deal with them was by two means either kill them off or death by a thousand cuts, death by a thousand cuts, is put them in the criminal justice system and then ignore all evidence of innocence. So go, yes, ma'am, please. So Erica hit on the major, some of the big major points. So I'll try to snake around there and get a few additional details. So the, the, the original situation in which Ed Poindexter and Mondo Walanga, who was then David Rice, came to join the Black Panther Party was police killings in Omaha. There had already been three police killings in Omaha, and they decided to join. There was a, some others had, a, Eddie Bolden and some others had started the Black Panther Party chapter. It wasn't really, it was functioning sort of on a social level, but not really meeting the service needs of the people. These brothers came in, they were serious. They went to Des Moines, Iowa and trained under Pete O'Neill. Pete told me that, I they didn't get that from Ed, that they came there very serious young brothers and trained under him, especially Ed would go and get the information and come and, come and bring it back. And in the course of them doing work, police patrols, uh, uh, um, a breakfast program, they had an, a, a 
another killing. And it was Vivian Strong. And I remember this, a 14, I was three, a 14 year old girl was shot in the back of the head in the projects by the police. Mm. Then the brothers stepped it up and they started a Vivian Strong Liberation School. They actually did it for a time in the headquarters and for a time they did it out of Mondo's house. They were pulled into a grand jury to ask them, what were you teaching in the the uh, the Vivian Strong Liberation School, which of course was African liberation and history. So they began to get on the radar of FBI director, and we've seen memos from the FBI director. Then, as you know, there's other things going around the country. Uh, there's bombings, and the white left, some of them have admitted doing some of the bombings. There's a bombing, and a police officer, it's a 911 call that, that uh, Ricky was talking about, uh, is a vacant house. A policeman went there and w- was killed in the bomb. The call, I've heard the call. The call had an older man's voice, very, very deep voice. It was 911. That call was hidden and not given, speaking to your thousand cuts, was get, was not given to the defense at the time of tr- the trial. It was said it was lost. So for years, all through the initial trial, you couldn't hear this. They brought a young teenager, 15-year-old Dwayne Peake, mm-hmm. to, to the courtroom. He said he didn't do it. He said, I don't have anything to do, to do with it. And they didn't either at the preliminary hearing. Senator Chambers was there, and Erica speaks to this. They pulled him out at a recess, brought him back, looked like he had been roughed up. The senator said he looked like he was been crying. They put sunglasses on him, and he said, yeah, I, I, I did it, and they told me to do it. Mm-hmm. And so the original, they Ed had an alibi. Mondo had an alibi. They were both with women somewhere else. They weren't at the scene. So they, mm-hmm. the charge, initial charge was conspiracy to commit murder. Then they said they found dynamite, blocked off all Mondo's house. They find dynam- dynamite in uh, Mondo's house. And Ed knew how to do it because Ed is a veteran. had been in the military. So Ed knew how to do it in Mondo. It was in Mondo's house. During the course of the trial, Mondo said, wait a minute, where they're showing that picture that there's a coal bin there? He said, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no coal bin there. where they." So the house burnt down during the trial. <laughs> so it's one thing after then, as Erica said, in 1996, they came back and they found the young man. Senator Chambers went out there to Seattle, Washington, where he where he now lives, Dwayne Peake. They pushed him into witness protection, took him out uh, to Seattle. They, they took Tom Owens, did a voice expert analysis. And I have to cr- uh, credit Tamik Alameen, some of the defense committee leaders at the time, um, took it, went out there, tested the voice, said this voice is not this 15 year old boy. It is. They tested it against Dwayne's voice. It's not him. Took it back to court. They refused to hear it. There was one break. There was a break in 1974. Oh, by the way, Ed has been eligible. It says he had he gets eligible for parole after two years. Right, now, this is right, right. 53 years later. So in 1974, the federal district court said the search of Mondo's home was illegal. Mind you, was the house was burnt down. The evidence was already gone, but said it was illegal in the first place. 1975, the circuit Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld it. The state of Nebraska, being as it is appealed with the police union, as Erica talked about, pushing, 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 Mm -hmm. appealed. The case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case, sent the case back to state court where it's been ever since. They've tried everything from habeas corpus writ to everything. uh, Bob Bartle, one of the attorneys, said, "We've, we've explored everything. We've tried to get it. Then in 1993, even before the voice analysis the results came out, the Nebraska Parole Board in 1993 voted to uh, release Mondo in 1990 or to commute a sentence to time serve and to do the same with Ed in 1994. It has to then go to the pardons board on which the governor, the secretary of state, and uh, who else is it? Attorney general for the state Mm -hmm. all sit. They said, no, we're not going to do it. And so this has been a political case from start to finish. Both men have maintained their innocence. The problem with the men and the reason that they were targeted was twofold, of course, because they were members of the Black Panther Party trying to right. secure freedom, trying to feed the people, trying to educate the people. And we have to remember trying to stop police violence and murders against Black people. This whole Black Lives Matter, I always say to, and I even said it to Melina out there, Abdullah, it just doesn't mean anything if you can't recognize those who first fought to try to free Black people from these police killings. And that is those Black Panther Party members. Right. Yeah, and, and, we, and, so, and, and yeah, and we like and and, and the echo, the echo of that point. That's why it's so uh, important that we have groups like Jericho, uh, because it's it's a result of Jericho that we constantly are reminded and made aware of political prison and what's going on in political. Prison. But more importantly, it's it's through Jericho that Ed's case is constantly uh in the forefront of of people's minds. But I agree with you that when it comes down to like. Uh, the mass a mass movement on political prisoners, then uh, we kind of fall short at time. But talk about uh, where where do we stand at in terms of and and 
any one of y'all can weigh in on this. Where do we stand at in terms of the possibility of getting this medical, getting a medical release? What's the success ratio in in uh in Nebraska with that? Because I know, like in the state of Maryland, where I'm at, I'm in the District of Columbia, but in the state of Maryland, you have to be literally. This is what they do here, where we at. The doctor got to diagnose that you're gonna die shortly thereafter you release. So it's not more so of like to let you go. It's more let you go and die on the street as opposed to let you go and try to get treatment. So where 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 do we where do we look at for us right now in terms of uh, a getting uh, the medical release? Well, I will say that he has he has is suffering a diminishing quality of life that's irreversible, which is the standard in Nebraska. And he is, that's what I would say. He's hes eligible, in our opinion, in the opinion of, of the attorney that the family's working with, because he has a diminishing quality of life that's irreversible. hes He is in a wheelchair. He's been wheelchair bound for years, but hes he has now amputated below the knee. He cannot turn over in bed very well, with, and he definitely can't sit up more than 10 seconds on his own. Um, he can't walk. He cannot go to the bathroom mm. by himself. So, and and um, Vicky, uh, when the last time y'all? When was the last time you you visited Ed? It's been about three months because, like, uh, the um, the difficult visitation hours. We live an hour away, which is right. not a lot. But if you got to be there at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. And, and then, but my mother's doing better. So she was like in a wheelchair and stuff like that. So now she's up on a walker. So we're going to make it, we're going to make it down there uh, sooner, but still once a week on Wednesdays is hard if you got to work or anything. Right. And, and, uh, Adrian, what do you, what do you want our audience to know about your brother as we, as we, move towards close. What do you what do you want to tell our audience about Ed that they need to know and, and how they and why they should become involved with Ed's case? Well because like I said, he doesn't deserve to be in there and he's been proven innocent. That's right. So he should be out. I mean and he he's a wonderful person. And because he has created programs in the prison to help other prisoners, he's gotten, he's has education. I mean, he's literally has helped them in the prison to control some of the prisoners. I mean, come on with the, uh, the programs on how to be a better person and things of that nature. You know, of course, I'm not technical, but he has done uh, multiple programs and things like that. When he was in Lionel Lakes, he used to work for him. I have a picture of him in a Kuji sweater. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it, it's unreal. Like, I feel like in Minnesota, they were just keeping him comfortable, trying to keep him quiet. And then right. he, but then he came back home because of promises of being able to have a new trial. And then he's been treated bad in Lincoln. And now my grandmother has passed on. So this fight is for my grandma. My grandma just knew that her child was going to make it out. And so this fight is for my grandma who passed on in 2011 and my baby sister three months after my grandmother. Like, right. we are losing people. And come on, make room for the real criminals is how I feel. <laughs> yeah, and we know that right now one of them got, about, I think, got like four different indictments coming out against him and he's able to walk the streets. Uh, he can turn himself in and, and then on, and get go right back out without... Uh, feel being locked up when the evidence is, is astronomical against him versus the evidence against Ed being astronomical against his innocence. So we, we got more evidence of Ed's innocence than we have of his guilt, but yet, uh, like I said, the death of a thousand cuts. But, uh, I'd like to, can I say something about Jericho before we leave? Yes, ma'am. I wanted to uh, express how closely uh, the family has been working with Jericho. Um, Ed's brother and wife, who, who is a um, power of attorney and power of medical, were able to take a trip up to Nebraska, uh, help being arranged by, of course, the family that's already there. And Jericho was able to help provide resources to help them make that way. Uh, recently, Jericho has helped to get out news about. So we work very closely with Jericho. I'm a former co-chair of Jericho, as well as a regional chair of Jericho, where her brother, her, her, her Ferguson, um, had appointed me 
uh, back in the late 90s when they had the Jericho March. So we've been working with Jericho very closely the whole time. And how, okay, closing out, uh, how do we get in touch or how do our audience get in touch or learn more about uh, Ed's case and how do you become involved in the latest initiative that's taking place on trying to get a medical release? Um, if they want to get like educated on the case, there's several YouTube videos some super interesting ones too. Even a cop that said, I think we did the right thing. What mm. does he mean he think he did the <laughs> yeah, right thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the, the YouTube videos, if nothing else, they're super informative, super interesting, super frustrating. But I mean, if they want to be caught up on the, you know, the case and what mm -hmm. went on, and they'll also see all the, you know, things that didn't match up and things like that. It, right. you, it, there, there's a big rabbit hole, what, what they call a rabbit hole with that. There's also a BBC documentary from back in 1993. You can contact myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you can contact, um, I'm gonna let Erica say it for sure if you want her to, but you can contact myself. You can contact uh, working uh, closely with uh, the New York uh, chapter of Jericho. Uh, to get out information. In fact, that's where we're sending information through. There's another um, uh, defense, local defense committee that the family has been working with, but the family has decided to take leadership because, and I'll just be honest, some folks feel that Ed would, would be better off going to, say, a, I guess a retirement home or something like that instead of the family. And, you know, with Jericho, we always, we always respect the, the position of the prisoner and always respect the position of the family. And so what other people think especially when they're not from our community, does not bear on the way they do things, the way we do things. It's two different things. Okay, there you have it, the real news. Rattling the bars. We want Ed home. And as uh, Ricky said, this is about uh, finding solace for his, his, his mother. This is about uh, reversing the injustice that's been taking place for over 50 years when all the evidence say that, that Ed is innocent. But more importantly, they need to be Ed and this co-defendant need to be exonerated because this is about innocence. This is not about uh, a technicality. This is about people that have done nothing other than stood up against police brutality, stood up against injustice, and because of this, they're suffering the death of a thousand. Cuts. Thank y'all for joining us today, and we and we we look forward to when A come out, be able to hug his sister, be able to hug his niece. Baby, hug uh, all his supporters and enjoy a nice meal with his family and that all his people behind him. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.